If you're interested in Roman history and perhaps military history in general, there's a fair chance you will have heard of the Battle of Carhai, 1453 BC. It was the first big set-piece encounter between the Romans and the Parthians, and it ends in a Parthian victory that turns into a major victory as much of the Roman army is captured or wiped out in the subsequent retreat. So Carhai is important, it's dramatic, but it has assumed an even greater importance in modern discussions of Roman warfare, the balance of power between the two empires, of Parthia and its objectives and its prowess. And perhaps it has assumed rather more importance and status than it deserves, and certainly it's been used to back up all sorts of arguments that are perhaps a little bit questionable. Now, in the book, The Eagle and the Lion, or Roman Persia, I spend most of a chapter looking at Crassus's campaign in 54-53 BC, and in particular, at the Battle of Carhai itself. And there are several reasons for this. One, of course, goes back to that simple fact. It is the first major encounter, and it's a serious Roman defeat, and we don't get good descriptions of too many major Roman defeats in battle. It's a great Parthian success, that's obviously the, uh, the counterpart of that, so it gives us an idea to understand how the Parthian military system worked, why the Parthians were so formidable, how they'd been so successful to create this empire that would withstand the Roman onslaught, that would not be conquered by Rome. But there's another reason why we tend to talk a lot about Carhai, and we tend to try to learn lessons from it. And that's a little bit more disturbing when you think about it, because it reflects the nature of our sources. Now, Carhai is described in some detail by Cassius Dio, writing in the early 3rd century, and in rather more detail, and apparently a more coherent manner, by Plutarch, the biographer, writing in the early 2nd century AD. So, Plutarch's century and a half after the events, Dio add on another century for that. Those are really our only two detailed narratives, and they are contradictory. Dio, in particular, seems heavily stylized. He talks about woodland in an area where there, there isn't a lot of that. And it's, it's an impression of lots of sound and fury and treachery on the part of the Roman allies, and hence the Romans are defeated. Because you have to remember that Dio was writing a history of many centuries of the history of Rome up until his day, rather than focusing on this in some detail. So it's a very stylized account, and a lot of Cassius Dio's battle accounts are more um, literary and um, dramatic than perhaps they are detailed and realistic. Plutarch gives a better impression, which is quite rare given that Plutarch is a biographer, not a historian, and himself makes the point elsewhere that a biographer's job is very different. He's talking about character and the how a person's um, nature shapes their achievements, their successes, their failures, determines their life. So you can see a whole sense of tragedy in his life of Crassus, that this is something that is predictable, not least in the vast um, list of omens he gives that's showing that this campaign by Crassus isn't going to go well. He's too old, he's not a good soldier anymore, he doesn't know what he's doing, he's too arrogant, he's too ambitious, he's too careless, therefore disaster follows. But we have these two relatively detailed accounts of this single battle. That's in marked contrast to all the conflicts that will occur between not just the Parthians and the Romans, but the Sasanian Persians and the Romans for centuries to come. The next battles that are described in anything like the same detail to Carhai do not occur until the 6th century AD, when you have Procopius's accounts of Dara and the subsequent fighting there, and you're talking about an empire that has changed dramatically, two empires that have changed dramatically, the Romans in particular, and a Roman army that is in many ways radically different from the one of the first century BC. It's not really surprising, over 500 years have passed. So that needs to remind us to be a little bit cautious about Carhai because it points out that Descriptions of battles between the Romans and the Parthians and the Sasanian Persians and the Romans are extraordinarily rare. We know that lots of wars were fought and within those wars there were quite a lot of battles. But we know almost nothing about them. Sometimes we barely know which side won and we certainly don't know how. 
The little descriptions we get elsewhere of fighting tend to be, again, heavily stylized and much briefer. We simply don't know very much. So, for instance, Crassus is defeated in 53 BC, but when the Parthians, backing the Roman Labienus, invade Syria, Palestine, parts of Asia Minor in um, 40 BC, and in the years to come will suffer a succession of serious battlefield defeats involving the, the death of one of their princes, the royal favourite Pacorus, and you know, serious tactical defeats that repulse this invasion. We know very little about how the Roman army achieved those, those victories. Why was the Roman army then so much more efficient? When Mark Antony invades Medea in um, 36 BC, we don't have much detail as to how things actually worked. And this was a campaign that didn't involve major battles. It's sieges, it's some fighting, but it isn't really two armies meeting in the same way they clashed at Carhai. So later on, when you get to the wars in the first century, you have some accounts in Tacitus of the fighting in Armenia. Again, they're quite literary, they're quite stylized, but they're also dealing with very different conditions. You know, Armenia is not known for its open rolling step land. This is a campaign that's dominated by sieges where the fighting does occur. It's also not entirely clear in each case who's involved in the fighting, whether these are the main force of the Parthian king of kings meeting up with a fully Roman organized regular army, often it's allies on both sides, and particularly from the point of view of the different Armenian factions involved. But there again, even when we know that there are regular Roman troops and there are royal troops of the Parthians involved, know very little about what happens. The wars of Trajan, of Lucius Verus, of Septimius Severus in the second century, let alone all the campaigns, the defeats of Valerian and others in the third century AD, are simply not recorded in detail. Now there may be reasons for that that we'll come on to in other videos and certainly I explore more in the book. For instance, when you have Ammianus Marcellinus detailed accounts of operations on the frontier between the Sasanian Persian and the Roman empires of offensives by each side, most dramatically Julian's big advance down the Tigris-Euphrates valleys. There are no accounts of large-scale, decisive pitched battles in those campaigns. Now, in part, that may be because those campaigns don't involve that sort of fighting. But what he spends his time on more than anything else is sieges. Those are described in great detail. We know quite a lot about those at that time, and they seem to be the dominant aspect and the decisive aspect of warfare. If you can capture the other side's wall cities, then you're doing well, you can have permanent gains. But there's impressions of raiding, of skirmishing, of encounters on the march, but again, it's, it's a very different type of fighting. So it is staggering that for all these centuries of warfare between the two, in many ways, the most, two most formidable empires, the two, two most formidable armies of this era, we don't actually see the Parthian or the Persian army facing up against the Roman army and have accounts as to what, how it played out, how each side fought, why they won, why they lost, what worked, what didn't, in any sort of detail. You've got little fragments scattered around everywhere. On the whole, though, it tends to be rather stylized, simplified, overly simplistic. And unfortunately, that's almost inevitably been the way that many scholars have looked at it. We, we all have, and I include myself in this. I did a video a little while ago about the Roman army at war, my first book, and I've my presentation of the Parthian army very much reflects the orthodoxy of how everybody else has considered this army, its strengths, its weaknesses, how it operated. But let's consider a few aspects of the Battle of Carhai itself, because the traditional view, the one you will hear repeated again and again, is that this shows the time when the Roman legion came up against a military system that was at least its equal and maybe its superior, at least in the right circumstances. And this is epitomized by the contrast between the Roman legionary, a heavily armed and armored foot soldier who fights in fairly close order in an organized disciplined formation and fights in successive waves as you, you commit reserves, 
and who, whose whole aim is to throw his pylum, his heavy javelin, at fairly close range. These are heavy things you can't throw too far. Follow that up with a charge, sword in hand, short cut and thrust gladius in hand, and carve your way through, punching with your shield and stabbing the enemy in the head or the belly. Carve your way through anyone who tries to stand up against you. It's very much, very aggressive, very direct, very much close in fighting, hammer the enemy until he's had enough and then kill him as he's running away. And that system is the system that we will see has defeated Hannibal, it's defeated the Macedonians, the Seleucids, it's defeated the Gauls, it's defeated a lot of the Germans, the Spanish, all sorts of different groups. This is the military system, the way of fighting that has carved out the empire. And by contrast, the Parthians are predominantly cavalry certainly their best troops. The Roman sources are utterly dismissive of Parthian infantry and anybody fighting on foot in the Parthian army, though that does raise all sorts of problems. But there are two types of Parthian cavalrymen, but the one that really captured the Roman imagination was the horse archer, not heavily armored. His whole way of fighting is based around speed of movement. This is someone who rides a light pony, rides it quickly and can ride it for a long time and keep going. This is someone who kills his opponents from a distance. He uses a powerful recurved composite bow and he shoots his arrows with great force at fairly short range, but quickly. Lots of arrows, arrows deluge the opponent with missiles, wound the opponent, weaken the opponent, kill the opponent, and if he's not dead, finish him off when he's scattered, when he's depressed. But you avoid contact. If the enemy comes at you shouting and waving his sword, you run away. You get out of the way and you shoot him and you keep shooting him. And of course, famously, we have the Parthian shot the, um, that meant when the rider turned around and fired behind him. Gosh, I've used the word fired. It's, it's so tempting. It's very difficult to speak or write about ancient pre-gunpowder weapons without using expressions like firing. Or, and you notice it in lots of movies where the order to a load of archers will be fire. Um, but you feel guilty as a historian whenever you do it. Of course, we're not talking about that. This is pre-gunpowder. This is all muscle-powered weaponry. Anyway, back to that ranting digression, just a confession of my own um, unreliability when it comes to terminology. So let's get back to the horse archer. The horse archer is very much a product of the great steppes and successive waves of nomadic, semi-nomadic tribes have appeared and will continue to appear, particularly in the north and the northeastern borders of the Parthian and subsequently the Persian Empire. And of course, that's where the Parthians themselves originate. So it's warfare that's designed for open grassland, rolling grass, grassland. There might well be lots of folds in the ground, lots of ridge lines, lots of hidden valleys, areas where you can hide. So it's not just about the enemy being able to see you all the time, but it is not close country. It's not a country of hedges, of walls, of buildings, of woodlands, of this sort of thing. And it's a type of warfare where land itself doesn't matter. If two groups of nomads, most of them horse archers, clash, they are not fighting to control a few square miles of grassland. It doesn't matter to them about the land. It's rather like if you think of the Second World War fighting in the desert, where the land itself mattered very little, if at all, with a few exceptions. This is country where it doesn't matter if you retreat because what are you giving up? A few miles of step, well, there's plenty more of that out there. And you have classic accounts when, for instance, the, the Scythians defeat the Achaemenid Persians of Scythian armies that just keep retreating and retreating and harassing and harrying the enemy, weakening them until they're so weak that they can be overwhelmed and shot down or charged down. It's a different definition of warrior virtue of courage. For the, the horse archer, for the Parthian or whoever he might be, retreating is common sense. You don't fight and die for land that's valueless. You wait until you're in a better position to kill and defeat your enemy. So you try to use control, you try to remain calm, and if you're at a disadvantage, then you get out of there and wait till you're at an advantage again and fight him that way. Whereas the infantry way of fighting of the Greeks before them and the Romans is rather more about dominating the ground. You, know, you have that 
tradition within Greek warfare, particularly between the, the classical city-states, but it, it's reflected elsewhere that the victor is he who controls the battlefield at the end and can set up a trophy and can bury his own dead and can make the enemy have to come and beg for permission and probably pay a ransom to ret retrieve his own corpses for decent burial. That's about controlling ground. That's where the land matters, where retreat is seen as undignified, unmanly, cowardly. So it's a contrast of systems, and there certainly is that basis there. But it's also a little too um, simple to see this as, well, the Romans are fighting in an old-fashioned, sort of almost European, we could call it a Western way if you wanted to, though again, that's simplifying things a great deal and the Parthians are represent a different tradition of retreat, weaken, harass, eventually destroy the enemy. You weaken him until you're stronger than he is, then you overwhelm him. And you don't care about ground, you don't care about retreating, you simply are calculating when is the best time to fight. There's some of that in this, and certainly there are aspects of the Battle of Karhai that fit this model. But we need to be careful because let's look at the battle itself and rather than see it as a clash of two systems and preordained to be a Parthian victory because the Romans simply can't catch the Parthian cavalry because the Parthian cavalry can always outrun them and therefore Crassus is bound to lose, that's probably not right either. So let's look at the situation. This is the second year of Crassus' attack on the Parthian Empire. We don't entirely know his overall strategic objectives. It probably had originally been involved with intervening in a Parthian civil war between two brothers who were fighting to be king of kings, but the, the one the Romans were going to support is dead before Crassus' expedition can actually set out. He's done things fairly methodically the year before. He's captured several cities. He's fought an action against the local forces of the satrap of that area and won. So the Romans have done moderately well. They've made progress and Crassus follows it up with a larger invasion. Now Crassus had begun with an army of seven legions, though we're told he was never able to recruit them to full strength. And this may well reflect the pressures of Pompey's large armies, which aren't fighting anybody, but they're still in service, and Pompey's name is a big and powerful one in Spain, because Pompey at this stage is governing the Spanish provinces from a distance. And of course, Julius Caesar is there charging around Gaul and crossing the Rhine and landing in Britain, fighting these intensive campaigns described in the Gallic War commentaries. And one interesting thing that I don't think people have picked on enough in the past is the similarities in behavior between the things Caesar describes and much of what Crassus does in this operation, but also happens in some of the, the subsequent operations. So, Crassus doesn't have a big army. He's left garrisons in many of these cities that he's taken, which does mean that even if he started out with 30,000 plus legionaries and other troops, he's unlikely to have had those in his field army at Carhai itself because there will have been some attrition, there's been campaigning up to now, but even more importantly, there are substantial garrisons. And we know they're there because in the subsequent retreat, Crassus's men move to some of these fortified cities that are held by Roman troops. So there are substantial numbers of Roman troops not involved in Carhai itself, not directly, they're not present on the battlefield. He's got about 4,000 cavalry, he's got about the same number of light infantry, though these are predominantly men who throw javelins, relatively short-ranged missiles that will put them at a severe disadvantage against the longer-ranged Parthian composite bows. For the Parthian army, we have a real problem. The traditional figure, the one that's repeated again and again, is that Serena had 10,000 men with him when he faced Crassus, 1,000 of them cataphracts, and the rest horse archers. And they were all horsemen. And therefore, that Crassus, who, again, in many of the accounts, people say, well, he's still got 35, 40,000 men. He's outnumbering the Parthians by this huge margin, and let, yet he still loses. The problem with that is there isn't really any basis for this. Plutarch mentions that figure of 10,000 and the breakdown of nine horse archers to one cataphract. 
but talks about this as the personal entourage of Serena. He does not say this is the army that's there at Kahai, although presumably the bulk of these troops, his personal household, the, the various soldiers who are obliged and noblemen who are obliged to fight and serve the Serena when he goes to war are there. But we also know that the satrap who's been defeated in the previous year is definitely present with the army as well, presumably with his troops. They may have suffered losses, but they're there as well. Um, and there is the real possibility that there are others. Although we know that the King of Kings is directing the main Parthian army against Armenia at the same time this campaign is going on, that doesn't mean that he's stripped Serena of everybody else. And we can probably say there wouldn't have been fewer than 10,000 men in the Parthian army at Kahai, but the probability is that this force is actually substantially larger. So while it's possible, perhaps even likely, that the Romans have a numerical advantage, it is not such a massive one. It's probably not two to one. Um, that would be the most, it's probably less than that. Now, of course, within that, the one thing where we can say the Parthians have a substantial advantage is in the number of cavalry, possibly the quality of that cavalry, but certainly the numbers. And you can think back to Polybius, who talks about the lesson of Cannae being that it's far better to have more cavalry than the enemy than more infantry, because as Hannibal had showed there, you can actually, if you've got a good force and you know how to use them, you can overwhelm the enemy because you're more mobile. So probably Parthian army is smaller, perhaps substantially smaller, but it is not tiny by comparison with the Roman force. And we do have to wonder, you know, the odds are there are some contingents that are on foot. There are some volunteers in the area that are perhaps of negligible military value, but they're there. They're also going to be support staff. I mean, we hear about the camel train that Serena has brought up carrying bundles of arrows to replenish the stocks of the horse archers as the battle progresses. And presumably there are people to look after to tend to these animals and to tend to the rest of the army and serve their needs. So there'll be a lot of camp followers. It, it's probably less of a clear, simple, highly mobile elite force running rings around the Romans than the easy story tends to suggest. But again, the easy story is a very familiar one and we've all told it. I've repeated, if you go back to the Roman army at war, I actually follow everybody else and say, well, of course, Serena had 10,000 men at Carhai, but he was still able to beat the Romans. But as I say, there is no reason to believe that. The odds certainly suggest he had substantially more than that. So, the encounter occurs when both armies are advancing. Roman scouts run into Parthian scouts and suffer badly. Again, this is something the Parthians are good at. And we know that Serena is a very experienced war leader. He's the man who's won the civil war between the two brothers who has been led the assault into one of the royal cities just a year or so before. So, you know, this is someone who's good. And Serena, though we know relatively little about him, certainly comes across in the sources as a very able man. So we have to allow for an element of, this is a particularly well-led Parthian army, but that also means, how do we judge it? Is this, in other respects, fairly typical? of the way the Parthians did this. You know, some people have singled out this supply train of extra arrows carried by camels as a sign of Serena being a genius. Others have said, well, actually, that's probably what the Parthians are doing all the time because it's a fairly logical thing to do. You know, we shouldn't expect ancient peoples of any sort to be dumb. They know what works. The Parthians haven't got this big empire by being stupid. They've got it by being very good at what they do. Good at fighting, good at ruling, good at governing good at controlling, and you could say all the same things about the Romans. So Crassus, the survivors of Crassus' scouts come back, report to him that the Parthians are there. He discusses, has a concilium with his um, senior officers. Again, very Roman thing. You can find it in Caesar. You can find it in plenty of other accounts. What should we do? Should we camp here where there's water? Should we advance? It's early in the day. He decides to advance and press the situation. Now, this is something that I... I tried to highlight way back writing the Roman army at war all those years ago. Another thing to remember of the context is that the Roman are, Romans had not encountered an enemy like the Parthians for a long, long time. 
they had fought against armies like the Armenians and the armies of Pontus that had some substantial numbers of predominantly heavy cavalry, but they didn't have the quantity and quality of the Parthian cataphracts and the Parthian horse archers. The Romans have got used to the idea that most armies within the area of Asia Minor and beyond in Syria are large but not particularly efficient. They're clumsy, they've got some very good troops but lots of poorer ones and you can usually overwhelm the good troops because the poorer ones just break. And they're probably expecting the Parthians to be a pushover just like the Armenians and the armies of Pontus. Though again, we should remember those armies did inflict defeats on the Romans at times. So it could go wrong even then if you take too many risks. But the Romans are coming with a very arrogant assumption that they're Romans, they're better, and therefore they'll win. Crassus himself has fought a difficult campaign against the slaves of Spartacus, but a long time ago. You know, his greatest victories were in the civil war before that, and then the Spartacus campaign, for which he didn't get so much credit, because once the danger was over, the Romans were less inclined to say, oh yes, the slaves were a dangerous enemy. They wanted to forget the whole squalid and nasty and frightening incident. So Crassus, for instance, for that victory only got an ovation rather than a triumph, which is mattered to the Roman aristocracy with their very competitive nature. But Crassus is old. This is a big emphasis in Plutarch and the other sources. Cicero's comment about Crassus being a worthless man. You know, he is probably too old. He's, he's well, into his, you know, well into the end of middle age at best. The other probability is, you know, we can talk about simple biological age, but different individuals age well or age poorly. And some people of the same age will seem older than others. Crassus seems to have struck people as rather elderly, rather frail, not the sort of man you would normally want to send in charge of a Roman army off on an arduous campaign. But what you can certainly say, that's to some extent an impression, but what you can say is he's never been to this area, and apart from his campaigns of the previous year, he's not fought in this part of the world before. He's never fought against an enemy like the Parthians. Well, as I say, no Roman has at this stage. But... He is a, someone whose greatest victories came against fighting predominantly infantry-based armies, like the other Romans in the Civil War in Sulla's day, or like the slave army of Spartacus. He hasn't had to confront an enemy fighting on its own turf and its own ground that is so very mobile. On the other hand, he will surely have studied, he will surely have tried to understand something of the enemy, but that doesn't mean they've got that good information to go on. In contrast, you, if you think of it from the Parthian perspective, and one of the aims of the book throughout is, even when we don't have the information, to ask the questions of, yes, fine, we're all very used to seeing this from the Roman point of view, but how about the Parthian point of view or the Sasanian point of view? What's in it for them? How are they likely to see these events? How are they likely to predict things? How are they likely to plan and operate? What do they think is going to happen? And again, you could argue that the Parthians are peoples who've got used to winning. They have beaten nearly everyone they've come up against before. So they are as confident as the Romans, because after all, they are the Parthians, they're the victors, they're the ones who created this big empire. Why should they worry about some load of foreigners from the West? You know, why should the Romans be any more frightening, any more deadly, any more dangerous than all the other enemies they've beaten before? Another thing to remember is that there is no Parthian alive with experience of fighting a predominantly heavy infantry army. In the past, they'd come up against the Seleucids with their pike phalanxes and all the supporting arms, but that's a long time ago. There's nobody still around to remember that. So while there may be a sort of element of folk memory, it isn't direct experience. So just like the Romans, the Parthians are coming to this battle not really knowing what to expect, but believing to, in their bones, really, that they are better than the enemy. Roman and Parthian alike think, expect to win, expect to be the best, expect an enemy, well, they might be tough, but we're going to win because of who we are. We've always won in the past. So the encounter happens when Crassus decides not to camp, not to do the cautious thing. Though, again, you could look at parallels in Caesar's commentaries of you know, do you stop, do you dig in and then fight the enemy the next day or see what happens? Or do you risk advancing and in some cases in Caesar building a camp right in the face of the enemy? 
Crassus pushes on. He forms his army into a big hollow square. Again, fairly familiar Roman formation. Advances. The Serena, he's got better information from his scouts who've won the skirmishes that have been fought. This is his country. He's got more information. So he chooses the spot where he waits for the Romans. And he's deployed his army to make use, presumably, of folds in the land so that they are, as far as possible, invisible until he wants them to appear and to be seen by the Romans. And Plutarch also mentions that he has the armour of his cataphracts covered with um, cloth, with dull fabric, so they don't betray their position by reflection. The Romans advance and the Parthians begin to beat their big drums. They, Plutarch says again that you know sound is something that has such a powerful influence on men's minds, makes them nervous, makes them frightened. It's very good. You can see with Serena this is good psychological warfare. He's prepared. He's going to overwhelm the enemy by, first of all, by the noise, the drumming, the threat, the brooding presence of an enemy you can't see. And then he reveals his army. The cataphracts pull off the covering so their armor gleams in the sunlight. And he expects that to be enough to shake the enemy, because again, he's used to winning. You know, he's a, a very good, very confident commander, and people like that go into battle expecting to do well. In this case, the Romans are less impressed than the Parthians might have hoped, but okay, you haven't won right at the beginning, you've got to fight a bit, but you're still very confident that you can sort out these invaders. The Parthians begin to harass the Roman square, and this is the la the this stage of the battle is very much dominated by the horse archers. The cataphracts are there, but they don't threaten the beginning because, again, their job, yes, these are heavily armoured men with the, the contos, the two-handed spear. They're designed to charge in, probably not very quickly, but perhaps trotting in in a fairly dense formation and look so scary the enemy runs away. But if they don't, you can stab down and break through them fairly quickly because it'll be very hard for them to injure you both horse and man being so well protected by armour. But that's for later. That's You do that when the enemy is weak enough to be swept away. So the horse archers come in, and this is the classic Kai. This is the Kai of everybody's imagination. Horse archers deluging the Roman square with arrow after arrow after arrow, and the Romans not being able to respond. The Roman light infantry run out, throw their javelins, but they can't catch the Parthians who dodge out of the way easily. This is not massed formations of archers. These are individual lines coming forward, peeling off, shooting, shooting again, returning, perhaps shooting back over their shoulder, doing the Parthian shot as they return to a safer distance, whilst another one's coming behind them and another one and another one. So the arrows are coming in. The Roman legionaries are fairly well protected with helmet, body armor, probably of mail, and the large scutum body shield. But nevertheless, there are vulnerable bits. The odds are that the arrows coming in are going to be shot at sufficient distance that the Parthians are not taking too much of a risk. They don't want to get caught by a javelin. They don't want to get um, their horse injured so they can't retreat. So they'll be a little bit cautious. They'll try and work forward depending on, they're going to be judging the situation. What's best for me? How tactically do I defeat this enemy? How do I kill this enemy? So how close is it safe to get? because I don't need to go beyond that point if I can still kill him from a distance where I am safe. So they're wearing the Romans down. Lots of wounds rather than lots of fatalities. The impression you get from ancient warfare in general is that missiles overall, including arrows, tend to inflict more injuries and wounds rather than outright um, crippling hits, let alone fatalities. You know, and you read, there's one centurion, for instance, in one of Caesar's battles in the Civil War, he's supposed to have had 120 missiles stuck in his shield, mostly arrows, at the end of, of one encounter. You've got these big shields, they do offer good protection, and lest the Parthians get very, very close indeed, which they're probably not going to risk at this point, an arrow is not going to go through the shield with sufficient force to wound the man behind. But you can't cover all of your body all of the time. There will be the gaps. You've got your face is vulnerable, your neck is vulnerable, your legs, your right arm are vulnerable if they are exposed. And the other thing is the sapping element of this. We don't really know how long this phase of the battle occurs, though it's probably for some time. The Romans are worn down, not so much because of the casualties, though those are significant, but the simple fact that they can't strike back. 
It's rather like in modern warfare, infantry being under bombardment. You ha take a pasting and men are falling. Maybe not many, but they're near to you and it could just easily be you. It's through luck and they're hit in the face, they're hit in the leg, they're hit in the hand. But you cannot strike back. You cannot stop this torment. So you're constantly in danger. There's constantly the fear, the threat, but the enemy won't stop and you cannot catch them and you cannot drive them away. The attempts to do so fail and the Romans largely give up. And they're hoping, we're told, this is Plutarch's version, that they're waiting for the Parthian horse archers to run out of ammunition, run out of arrows, and then retreat, at which or be forced to fight hand to hand. And if they fight hand to hand, well, the Romans are confident, they're good at that, we can sort them out. If they retreat, well, okay, we can move on. They've retreated. They've ceded the battlefield to us. This doesn't happen because of, famously, we've already mentioned them a few times, the, the camel train bringing supplies of bundles of arrows. Now, this is very important that the Parthians have this resupply. And again, I'm personally, I'm, I'm more persuaded by those who argue this is, is sort of good operating procedure for any Parthian army rather than the unique genius of the Serena. Even so, do remember this. Arrows are bulky. They're big. They're not necessarily that heavy, but they're, they're, they're awkward to carry. There is a limit to how many, even an organized army like this with hundreds of camels can carry on campaign. Something significant for the aftermath of the battle. But eventually the Romans work out that the, the weight of arrows coming in at them is not slackening, that the men are getting depressed because they can't strike back, and the, the steady trickle of casualties is weakening the Roman army and weakening it. And this is, this is a good way of fighting as far as the Parthians are concerned. This is very much playing to their strengths. At this point, something that tends to be poorly understood occurs because Crassus orders his son, Publius Crassus, to advance with 1,500 cavalry, some light infantry, and eight cohorts of legionaries and see if he can attack the Parthians, see if he can bring on a close combat. We don't quite know where they come from, whether they're one side of the Roman square, whether they're a separate force that's been held inside or back to the flank or whatever. We don't know. Again, this is Plutarch, and we're lucky to have as detailed an account as he gives us, but it's, um, it, are, it begs lots of questions. Now, Publius Crassus has done quite well serving in Gaul with Caesar, and he gets a very good write-up in the commentaries of Julius Caesar. Now, obviously, he's the son of Crassus, Caesar's great ally, so Caesar's not going to say bad things about him, particularly if, as I believe, those, uh, each book of the, the commentaries is published at the end of that year's campaigning. So some of this is happening, is being released while Crassus is still alive. He's won through boldness. He, Caesar credits him with making a decision to commit some third line Roman legionary cohorts, because although he was commanding the cavalry, that meant that he was out on the flank in a battle against the Germans and he could see better what was going on. He saw a threat that Julius Caesar and his other senior commanders didn't see. He acted upon it and it was successful. Well done him. Good, proper Roman way of doing things. Later, he's fought an action where he advances as an independent commander, commanding a reinforced legion, his advance guard gets into trouble, but he commits more and more troops and keeps on attacking and wins. That's probably a good context for what he does now. Because he advances and the Parthian horse archers retreat. Again, that's their job. This is not the Parthian morale collapsing. It's more, right, well, we don't really want to fight these fellas toe-to-toe, hand-to-hand. -to -hand, so let's move back. Let's be ready to... Um, fight when we have the advantage. Again, it's wait until that's the, the situation. Another thing to remember, and we sometimes take it rather glibly that there are all this resupply of arrows and therefore the Parthians can keep on shooting. Bear in mind, it does take a while for each man to go back to the arrow train to get fresh ammunition, to take it and then go forward again to use it again. And any sort of archer will tell you that your arm does get tired. It's good to have periods of rest not that you can't shoot anymore, just that you will become less accurate. So even though these are highly trained, very physically fit individuals, lulls in the fighting, drawing your breath, letting your horse draw its breath as well, all make sense. They're a good, sensible way of fighting. So however many horse archers Crassus, uh, sorry, Serena had, he's probably not going to be able to commit all of them all of the time to the fighting. So only a proportion, a minority probably, are currently engaging the Romans at any one point. That group 
retreats when Publius Crassus advances with his detachment and he chases them, which again is what he's done with in Gaul to great success. And presumably that's the whole point. You attack not just to make them go back a bit, but then come return in half an hour and start shooting you again, but to make a difference, to change the tactical situation, force them back, force a battle more on the Roman terms, or for the Parthians to retreat altogether so the Romans can recover and then push on with the campaign. Now, again, people don't think this through. Crassus is advancing with a force that includes a substantial number of legionaries on foot. The Parthians retreat and Publius Crassus follows them. He then disappears from view. Now, this implies that he has gone both a distance, so that it's difficult for Crassus's father and the main army to see him, but also, again, we're talking about folds in the landscape, ridges, defiles, valleys, this sort of thing, gullies, all of these things that will break up. It's rather like that deceptive element on the, you know, the plains of America where it, the ground could look empty, but it isn't. Um, because what's this, it's, it's, it might look flat, but it isn't quite as flat as you think it is. But Publius Crassus leads his troops a long way, and the Parthians keep retreating a long way ahead of him. And as far as we can tell, the impression is from the accounts that just about everybody has drawn away from the main Roman army. This isn't just the group of Parthians where Publius Crassus attacked. This is all the harassing force. Crassus's troops are largely left to their own devices, and the main Roman army then faces a choice, or its commander, faces a choice. Does he continue to advance following behind his son? He's not going to be able to keep pace with that relatively small force, but nevertheless, he can keep moving, catch up with them eventually. Or does he stay where he is, start to deal with all his casualties, his wounded, make sure they're treated properly, consolidate, perhaps build a camp so that he can settle down and see what the situation looks like on the morrow? And recall his son if he's going to do that. In fact, Crassus chooses the middle option. He stays where he is, he retreats to higher ground, what he considers to be a better position, but his mindset is still essentially defensive. I'll go somewhere strong where it'll be harder for the Parthians to hurt me. But while he's doing that, he doesn't say to Publius Crassus, okay, you've driven them off, come back, rejoin the main force, let's reform. Instead, he lets his son keep going. And Publius Crassus does keep going, until he runs into substantial Parthian forces. Now, this is partly deliberate. The Parthians are doing fighting in the way they understand. Okay, give way when the enemy's pressing, but gather your force, gather your force, wait till you're stronger, you have the advantage, then turn on him and overwhelm him. Some of it may be chance. He may simply run into um, Parthian forces that are waiting, resting, ready to be committed in part because that's presumably the direction where the Parthians will naturally retreat. So there's an element of being lured onto it, there may be an element of chance, but Publius Crassus disappears. He then gets involved in a much harder fight that starts to look rather like the earlier battle against the main army because he's harassed by horse archers, but this time it's very clear there is a substantial force of cataphracts that prevents him from driving off the horse archers. His men presumably are tired, We've got to be thinking in terms of several miles distance away from the main force. So they've traveled that time. So again, this is taking time, an hour, maybe more. You know, this is not all happening in the space of a few minutes. He's had time to advance a considerable way, disappear from sight, disappear from immediate contact. When he runs into more Parthian forces and things start to go badly, he sends messengers back to his father. But Plutarch tells us the first few to be sent don't get through, they get intercepted and killed. But again, there's time for all this to happen. And the Parthians don't overwhelm Publius Crassus in a matter of minutes. This again is quite a slow, prolonged encounter where the Parthians take their time and do the job properly and fight in a very skillful way. So they harass him, they weaken him, his cavalry, particularly the Gallic and German cavalry that he's brought himself from his campaigns under Caesar, boldly attack the cataphracts and they're, they're very brave, they're very skillful, they're very confident warriors, but they're equipped with a mail shirt, a shield, a lighter spear or javelin, a sword, a helmet. They're up against men with full mail covering their legs, arms, possibly even face protection as well as the helmet, and the horse is armoured. So Plutarch has this, this dramatic account of 
some of the, the Germans and Gauls, you know, dismounting, jumping off their horses, hamstringing the cataphracts, because otherwise they just couldn't hurt them. They couldn't break through their armour. And yes, these are these cavalry from um, Gaul and Germany, they're, they're brave, they're skillful, they're from a warrior class, they're highly motivated, but they're also up against the Parthian cataphracts who are brave and skillful and very well trained from a warrior class and much better equipped. And this is on ground they've chosen. Publius Crassus has bumped into them. So they can't drive off the cataphracts. The cataphracts win. They don't win so decisively that they can just sweep Crassus's force, Publius Crassus's force away, but they do weaken and they stop them from driving any further forward. Publius Crassus then holds up on some high ground and tries to form a circle so he can fence the enemy, hold the enemy off until hopefully his father will arrive with the main army and the cavalry will turn up and everything will be great and the Parthians will have to retreat again. And finally a messenger, at least one, does get through to Crassus back with the main force asking for help, asking for support from his son. Crassus doesn't act upon this. He still hesitates. He did this. He doesn't know what to do. So there's been a succession of poor decisions on Crassus's part to be contrasted with the rather good decisions that Serena seems to be making. But we do have to ask ourselves some basic questions. If Crassus had followed his son's advance force from the beginning, he couldn't have kept pace with them, but he would have been fairly close. They certainly would have been isolated for such a long time then at the very least, he probably could have preserved most of that force, advanced, joined them, and then presumably built a camp or settled down for the night in that position further forward. Whether or not he could have forced the Parthians to fight on his terms is much more questionable. You know, you'd think on the whole, probably they're just going to retreat again. So rather as Mark Antony would find a few years later, when he thought he had a tactical advantage over the Parthian army, they simply fled. They ran away, he inflicted some casualties on them, but casualties that were relatively light didn't cripple their army. They were ready to fight him again the next day. So catching them was always going to be, going to be a problem. But it did mean that when the Romans come with a tacti tactically coherent, well-organized force, the Parthians will tend to give way and retreat because they see no percentage. There's no sense in it for them to suffer heavy casualties in a risky head-to-head -head encounter that's playing to the Roman strengths rather than their own. This is all about being smart in the way you fight. So the Crassus could have done that. He might even have succeeded in saving his son if he'd moved later on, assuming some of those early messages had got through, or even that final one. Now, Publius Crassus's men take a long time dying. And this is clear from the accounts. They, and also just when you think about it, because again, they have to be bombarded with lots and lots of arrows. The horse archers shoot at them and men are wounded, men are suffer, and eventually they, um, they despair. And Publius Crassus commits suicide or gets a friend to help him commit suicide. So do several of his close friends. Crassus, Publius Crassus has been wounded by this time. That's partly why he can't do the job himself. But they give in and they are overwhelmed in the end by cataphracts charging in because the survivors are so weary, so scattered, so shaky by this time because they've just been stunned by this constant deluge of arrows that kills one man, then another. But it's gradually, you're weakened, you're weakened, you're weakened until you simply can't stand up to an assault. So they're defeated and the Parthians, which again must take time, they cut off Publius Crassus' head, the force of Parthians that has concentrated there and the main army moves back to confront the main Roman army that's sitting there on the high ground that Crassus has chosen. Crassus goes through a sort of seesaw of emotions. For a while he's depicted as the best sort of Roman commander. You know, he sees his son's severed head, the mockery of the Parthians, but he dismisses it. This is a personal tragedy. We need to think about Rome, we need to think about the Republic. There's still a battle to be won, so fight hard. So he encourages his men, he does a good commanding, inspirational job at least for a while, although later in the day he will despair completely and have some sort of breakdown, cover his head and all this sort of thing. Um, but you come back to the situation right at the beginning, but worse, because the Parthians are still bombarding the Roman square with arrows, and this is where the main force gets whittled down, suffers even more casualties. If the Romans try and counterattack, the cataphracts ride them down because the Romans are weaker. They're tired, they're weary, they are 
um, they've seen too many comrades fall by this time. But even so, even at this point, and even with some of the dramatic accounts in Dio particularly, but also Plutarch, of cataphracts charging, of you know using the contour spear to spit two Romans at a time, um, Yes, there are disasters. There are bits of the Roman army that are overwhelmed. However, the bulk of Crassus's army is intact at the end of this battle. It does not collapse. It can't just be swept away by the Parthians, who by this time themselves must be very tired. This has been a hard fight. It's too easy to see this as a walkover for the Parthians without thinking about the time, the effort that's involved. The Parthians have fought a very hard battle. They fought it very well skillfully and bravely, but it's hard work. This is going to leave anybody weary. The day is coming to an end, night's beginning to fall, the Parthians don't like camping next to an enemy in the darkness because obviously an army that relies very much on mobility, on fighting from horseback, loses most of those advantages at night, added to which your camp with all those horse lines is vulnerable to attack. So they pull back some way and the Romans are left there. So again, this is clearly a Parthian tactical victory. They have severely weakened the Roman army at far lesser cost to themselves. And they've dominated the Romans and they've broken the morale of the Romans, but they have not destroyed the Roman army. Crassus despairs, his commanders have a conference. Eventually the Roman army decides to retreat under cover of darkness, abandoning its wounded who can't be moved. Their cries of asking for help, asking for, for mercy, people take, you know, take pity on me, do save me. Those alert the Parthians, but again, the Parthians don't really resume the pursuit, the pursuit or adopt this pursuit until the next day. So Crassus retreats and it's in those next few days as he moves back to Carhai itself, takes shelter there, tries to get back across the Euphrates into Syria. That's when the Roman army is largely destroyed. And of course, running away in front of a mobile, skillful and aggressive opponent like the Parthians is always going to be extremely dangerous. Any retreat tends to break an army's morale, but one like this is exceptionally dangerous. And Crassus negotiates with the Parthians and is killed, perhaps by accident, perhaps confusion during the negotiation. Some of his men retreat individually, Cassius, the man who'll be more famous as one of the assassins of Julius Caesar years later, who is Crassus's quaestor or probably his pro quaestor, his financial official second in command, runs fairly early, breaks off for Syria with some cavalry and rides away. Others do the same. So you have to remember in Plutarch's account, there's clearly a source that was very favorable to Cassius, perhaps one written by the man himself, where Cassius keeps on understanding what's going on, having the right idea, and Crassus goes and fouls things up. Cassius will base a lot of his career around what he did then and his heroic defense of Syria and Antioch in the years to come. But we do have to remember that he's an officer who abandoned the main Roman army with a small force pretty early on. So the reason he's so uh, keen to show how brave and heroic he was, well, that's partly because there's questionable aspects of his behavior as well. So the Roman army is destroyed in the fighting that occurs afterwards, in the retreat, and only a minority get away. Cassius is able to form two understrength legions with a mixture of the garrisons, the troops left behind in Syria, and the survivors that get through. Substantial numbers of prisoners are taken and led off to a life of well, indentured labor, slavery, call it what you will, under the control of the King of Kings. And there's all sorts of theories over the years about where they went and what happened to them, which we don't need to go into. But they're, they're clearly an issue because later on under Augustus, there'll be talk of um, getting these people back, returning the men who'd been captured, even though they've been living in the Parthian Empire for decades, and many of them have settled down and come to terms with it and are rather happy with where they are. So that's the big disaster. One interesting thing, and okay, this is from Dio, so I generally his, his account seems less convincing than that of Plutarch, but he talks about the Parthians running out of arrows in, during this pursuit stage. And that's logical, because again, as I said before, arrows are bulky. You can carry a good supply, you can resupply, but you can't carry an infinite amount. It's simply impractical you are going to run out, you are going to use a lot because the whole style of fighting requires 
a lot of expenditure of missiles, a lot of expenditure of arrows, some of which might be retrieved and reused, but a lot won't be. And you are wearing out. So the probability is that if Crassus had managed the retreat rather better, he might have got away with rather more of his army. But he doesn't, and his most serious mistakes perhaps come then, and Serena exploits the situation extremely well. He, again, he fights that stage of the campaign cleverly, just as he's done the earlier stages. At least as far as we can tell. Again, we're getting this from the Roman side. We don't know the inner debates between different Parthian leaders, whether there are differences of opinions, whose will, whose um, uh, advice prevailed. All we can say is that the Parthians did well. And they probably had luck on their side too, because the Romans keep marching at night, they keep getting lost, they get confused, they go in the wrong direction, and they're getting nervous. But nevertheless, credit where credit is due, it's all very well saying, well, this is a Roman disaster because the Romans make lots of mistakes, and they do. But you should always say it's also a big Parthian success because the, Ro the Parthians do things well. And that's true on both sides in all these campaigns that will follow it. It's, it's somewhere between the two. It isn't simply one side's great or one side's really successful and the other side isn't. So Crassus retreat, oh sorry, the remnants of Crassus' army retreats, Crassus is dead, Cassius gets back to Syria, the Serena is executed after great triumphal processions through Seleucia, Tessaphon, that area, showing off this, this victory by a king of kings who's a bit wondering a little bit, this man might be a little bit too powerful, a bit too charismatic, a bit too successful. At least that's the story told from the Roman versions. We don't get, again, the Parthian sources to tell us the real politics going on. So it might be more complicated than that. So what are the lessons that we should be learning from Carhai? First is that it's unusual because we've got this detail that we can analyze the battle in this way, even though there are still bits we don't know and we'd like to know. There are clearly Roman mistakes, Parthian good ideas, good successes that combine to make this battle the serious Roman defeat that it is. But the battle itself is only part of that. It's the wider campaign and the pursuit afterwards that devastate the Romans. We know from else other periods that the Romans won lots of battles. So something changes, people do things differently. The balance between the two forces obviously alters as time passes and people learn. One theme of the book is how each side learns from mistakes, tries to improve and the balance of advantage shifts back and forth. You can reform, get a better army, do things better, but after a while, the other side works out how to counter that. So it's, it's never one way and it's never all about the Romans any more than it's all about the Parthians or the Persians. It's about both and they're both smart and dangerous and sometimes stupid and sometimes corrupt and sometimes incompetent and, you know, they make mistakes, but they also do things well, both sides. But what you cannot do is use Carhai as a typical battle because it isn't. It's the first and it's under peculiar circumstances and what happens there isn't repeated routinely in later centuries. There are serious Roman defeats though we can't usually say why they occurred. The Sasanian Persian army by the time we see it in the 6th century is completely different from the Parthian army of the 1st century BC. If you look at Procopius, if you even look to some extent at Ammianus, the role of horse archers seems much diminished. That's a, another theme. We can look at balance of, of armies later on. But another thing to remember, another note of caution that we need to have before saying that Kahai explains everything is this. Kahai meant the Romans suffered losses of perhaps at most 20, 25,000 men killed and wounded, uh, sorry, killed and prisoners. Perhaps 30,000 if the estimates for Crassus' army are pushed to the very maximum, but that's extremely unlikely. Now that's a serious defeat. Carhai was a major battlefield defeat. However, it isn't like the Battle of Cannae where you lose 50,000 plus dead, let alone tens of thousands of prisoners, or the Battle of Arausio, where the Cimbrian Teutones smashed two consular armies at the end of the second century BC, in 104 BC. And this Arausio and Cannae tend to be remembered by the Romans as great disasters. 
Carhai is a disaster on the scale of the Teutoburg Wald, where three legions and their auxiliaries are wiped out in Germany in AD 9, though again the Roman army has changed a little bit back then, its recruitment patterns have changed a little bit, but nevertheless it's more on that scale. And we don't talk about them so much because we don't have detailed accounts and they don't occur at the first encounter between the Romans and a people, but you know, the Arausio was the last in a succession of major defeats inflicted by the tribes on successive Roman armies. There were other defeats in Gaul. There were serious defeats in all the parts of the Iberian Peninsula at different times. There were serious defeats in Thrace. In the first century BC and second century BC before it, it isn't unknown. It's not that unusual for a Roman proconsul or propraetor or serving magistrate to get killed at the head of his army fighting against foreign enemies. So there are rather more Roman disasters on this sort of scale than we tend to remember because we don't have the detail because they don't occur in different circumstances. So we single out Carhai far more than the Romans ever did. It became important for Augustus's public image, his propaganda to emphasize avenging Crassus um, and the humiliation of the lost Roman eagles and standards. You know, it's there on the Prima Porta statue on the breastplate. It's the the centerpiece of Mars Ultor, the great temple Augustus built in his forum that you can still see there today in Rome, where the, the standards lost by Crassus and by Mark Antony and by a few other commanders were returned by the Parthians as a result of a treaty and brought back and reinstalled there, restoring Rome's honor. So it is a bad defeat, and it's a bad, but it's also a bad defeat because Crassus is there and Crassus is famous. And many of the, the other Roman commanders who die, we know less about, and they'd had less of a political role. And it does encourage the civil war between Caesar and Pompey because it severely unbalances that alliance between the three men. So Kai is important. Kai needs to be understood, but we need to be a bit more subtle in the way we look at it. And we need to put it more in context, both of the, the campaign, but also how Roman warfare worked. So hopefully, and this is only, even though I've gone on this video far longer than I planned to, as is my want, this is only an introduction to the discussion in the book, but it's important. It's the battle discussed in most detail in the entire book, simply because we know more about it, but also because it's been so used in different ways that are, I think, rather unwise. So that's a little bit of the story of Kahai, and you'll see more, you'll be able to read more when the book comes out um, next month in Britain. You can see the British one there behind me. That's coming out on the 6th of July, and then the Roman Persia, the basic books edition in, the Amer in America, is coming out in September. So there's a lot more in this, but hopefully this will be a taster of the sort of things I talk about and how I hope I'm coming with a fresh approach to this bigger question, but also looking at the wider struggle and not simply at seeing Kahai as a simple event. That's it. It's dramatic. It's all simple. We understand. So anyway, that's the talk and I hope you enjoyed the talk and I hope in time you'll enjoy the book.